Hey everybody, it is Doc Parsley here, code day 63 million or something like that. I uh, wanted to talk quickly today about rational versus irrational thought, uh, what's going on currently. Might get a little outside of my scope here today. Uh, so bear with me if you want to, and if you don't, you can turn it off. So first I would like to go to the normal thing I do, which is let's pull up the current stats. Um, I bring this up every day because I find it um, a reasonable way to apply some rationality to what's going on. But I can tell you these numbers are getting a bit messy and concerning, and I'll tell you what I mean. So, <clears throat> worldometers, uh, this is the most up-to-date. This would Johns Hopkins site. You can choose your poison. The numbers are about the same. Um, so, coronavirus cases. This is, this is, again, a misnomer. I bring this up every time. These are simply people who have tested RT-PCR positive meaning they've done the swab and they've found the genetic material for this virus in that person, or at least very similar genetic material. So if we give them leeway and say they're hundred percent accurate, they have positively found two and a half million people roughly with the virus. Of course, as I always say, there's a severity bias here. The severity bias meaning that, these 2.5 million, two and a half million people who have been, who have been tested, um, it varies from country to country and region to region within that country as to how they test. And that's important because if, again, we say that the test is 100% accurate, which there's no way that's possible, but just to make things simple, if it's 100% accurate, then that's only 2.438 million people who have actually been sick enough to go seek help and get tested. By and large, that's true, okay? There's been 167,000 deaths out of this number. Uh, what commonly gets <coughs> reported is these closed cases down here. So I'm bringing this up every day that, uh, you know, there, there's an old saying that figures lie and liars figure. Uh, I don't, I, I'm not going to um, imply any sort of intent. I'm just going to point out the fact that these numbers are getting to be what I believe is misleading. Um, I, again, I don't know if it's intentional. I don't know if it's some convention that's being done for another purpose, but let's, let's bring it to the forefront of reality. So the reason that there aren't 2.4 million cases is because 167,000 people have died and 640,000 people have recovered. So that that doesn't make these numbers correct. Um, if you do the math, they don't work out. So what they're saying is, well, um, 1.6 million active cases, 3% are serious or critical. Now I've been pointing this out for a couple of weeks. I've been following this site for over a month. And this originally was hovering between 94 to 95% mild. And this was, uh, running uh, four to or five to six percent critical. Again, that's only out of people who sought care. People who sought care, we were, we we're saying, okay, five to six percent of them were serious or critical. That hovered there for a while, went down to four, four to five percent, hovered there for a while. And I'd say for probably the last week, uh, it's been three percent, meaning that we're finding more people who aren't serious or critical. So this number will continue to drop as we test more people. To, but again, to point it out, the 2.4 million positive tests, 
is not even close to the total number of positive people, meaning the total number of people who would be positive if, if given the test. Um, and we don't know what that number is, but there's some research to, su to suggest that it's um, at least um, at least 20 fold. Uh, the California research in Santa Clara revealed 50 to 85 percent fold or 50 to 85 fold meaning 50 times this number or 85 times this number, somewhere in that range. Um, and then the, the percentage of deaths here, um, the numbers can get messy and they're really messy with the US and I'll, and I'll point that out. So if you read this incorrectly, this would, this would very easily look like 21% of all people with coronavirus are dying. And that's not at all, that's not at all true. They've tracked 805,000 cases out of 2.4, right? That's the difference. You add these two up right here and they'll equal that. Um, and what they're saying out of all the ones that they've tracked and the ones that they know of, 21% of the serious and critical people are dying. 21% um, of 3%, that's one out of five of 3%, which brings that down to what about 0.7, 0.7% um, would be total. And again, that's if this number were accurate. So if we look at all the people who've had it and asymptomatic, just do some quick math here. You can do this on your iPhone like I am. It doesn't take any kind of um, brilliant mathematics here. So if, if we look at um, coronavirus cases uh, and deaths, so 167,000 people have died. If we divide that by the total number of cases that we know about, 2.4 million, we, we come up with a 7% death rate. That's pretty high. That would be crazy high if that were the real number. Now, if we take in, but it still wouldn't be 21%, right? Okay, so 21% is not the number to be focusing on. Um, now, if we went with the low end and we said 2.4 million, but we believe that the prevalence is at least 50 times that. So uh, that would be 120 million. So then if we said 167,000 out of 120 million have died, we would end up with a 0.14%, 0.14%. So slightly over a 10th of a percent of people would die. And of course, that's treating everyone equally and we know that's not the case. Um, the older you are, the more infirm you are, the more comorbidities you have, the more likely you would be that 0.1%. If we took it out uh, to 85 times uh, just to see what it would look like, that would be roughly 200 million, which would leave a 0.08%. So less than a tenth of a percent um, would be succumbing or dying uh, due to COVID. So... The reason I belabored that today is if uh, I saw some concerning numbers, I go down here and I, like I said, I've been tracking this every day. If you look at yesterday, we had 1500 deaths, which is lower than we've been having. Today is Monday, paperwork will catch up, probably we'll have a relatively high number today, but we seem to have peaked given all the data. Um, now, America is being criticized for not testing enough. Um, I'm not going to weigh in on that. What I will say is that we've tested almost 4 million people. Uh, Russia is the next best country. They've tested almost 2 million people. Who knows if we can believe that. They've only had 361 deaths out of 2 million tests and 42,000 positive cases. Probably not true. Um, Germany, um, well, let me, let me go back on that. That could be true depending on how they're counting deaths. Uh, in America, as you have probably heard, 100% um, of people who have a positive coronavirus assay, when they've swabbed them and they've said, you have, you have the genetic material in your body that we believe is associated with COVID, you therefore are going to be a COVID death if you die. Or even once they die, they test them and find it and they say, okay, they died from COVID. I'm not going to weigh in on whether or not that's a rational thing to do or the appropriate thing to do, I'm not a policy person, I'm just talking about the true math and the true science here. 
Um, and they're even calling some uh, corona related deaths, meaning if, if they believe that you would have otherwise lived from whatever killed you if the hospitals weren't so impacted or and of course, the hospitals being impacted, that's a slippery subject because that doesn't mean that the hospitals are overwhelmed. That means that could mean that they didn't admit you to the hospital because they're concerned about being overwhelmed. And this is true even in states that have had and cities that don't have a high case, but it's there's policy in place as to when they're going to admit people. Uh, you may have heard that they're laying off a lot of healthcare workers right now. A lot of people are losing their jobs. These healthcare workers that are, you know, being touted as national heroes right now are losing their jobs because they're not on the front lines of COVID and the restrictions around who can come to the hospital, who can be admitted, who can have surgeries done on is making people unemployed. If we had the full services of all our healthcare professionals and we could admit everybody who might be, you know, possibly critical or you know somebody who might be concerning we could give them better care they may not have died even if they didn't have covid and they're calling that a covid death as well and then they're just presuming that people dying at home who haven't been tested because the number is higher than usual they're going to say okay well those are covid deaths again i'm not weighing in on whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing to do i'm just reporting what's being done and that's important to know so the, the point is that USA, Russia, Germany, Italy, Spain, the UAE, Turkey, South Korea, not necessarily counting deaths the same way, not, don't necessarily have the same threshold for admitting people, don't necessarily have the same thresholds for who we test, okay? So all of that weighs into it, but uh, the way this has to be approached is you either trust all the data or you trust none of the data. So we just take it at face value. Now, again, let's go back up here and look at total number of cases, total number of deaths, total numbers recorded. Out of all of the cases that are currently active, I mean, they haven't died, they haven't recovered. Out of all the total cases, 97% are mild, meaning they do not need medical uh, attention. Excuse me. They might feel really crappy. <laughs> they might be really sick, but they don't need medical attention. They're really sick at home, okay? Um, so out of all of the active cases, 97% of them are mild, meaning those 97% have almost a zero chance of dying from COVID. And we have to be honest here, we are, what we are tracking is deaths. If this weren't killing people, we wouldn't even consider shutting down the economy and doing things that we're doing politically. So 3% serious or critical, 21% uh, of that 3% are dying which we just covered what those numbers pro possibly are and by the math um, if, with the total deaths around the total number counted, we're at 7% death, right? That's worldwide. Now, here's why I'm concerned. Um, we've done almost 4 million tests. We have positive 764,000 tests, which is what about a third of the world. Uh, so we're obviously testing a lot. We've added 25,000 cases. That's coming down. We've been uh, adding you know, 30 some odd thousand, but, but we don't really know how important that is, right? What, what's really important is how many serious and critical cases are we adding? We're not adding very many. Um, you know, this number is not, this is not significantly changed in the last three or four days I've been looking at this. It's, it's been around 13,000. So these are the only people who might die. But let's look at, click on the USA and see what the USA's data is. Well, 707,000 totally total cases, 41,000 deaths, 71,000 recovered. So uh, roughly 100 and well, here it is, 112,000 closed cases with a death rate of 37%. <gasps> Man, America really sucks. We're having terrible outcome. Mm, not so fast. What this means is that we aren't following up a lot of cases. We don't know who's being recovered and just, right? So we are not tracking the numbers well enough if we're seeing at 37% of the closed cases are ending in death. Uh, that means that we're not tracking, if we go back, 
we're not tracking this population, right? We're not tracking that population at all if we're getting 37% over here, right? These numbers are based off of the known outcomes. So let's do the numbers in a different way. Let's say we have a total of, well, hold on. So the total number of deaths, 41,000, 300 ish. Hold on, I messed that up. 41,300 ish divided by total number of positive cases, 770,000. That would be a 5% death. Okay. Now, again, we aren't catching every single case. If we, if we believed that there were only 770,000 people in America with coronavirus, or who have ever had coronavirus, then we would have a 5% death rate, not a 37% death rate, right? But even that's not true. Like we said, it's 50 times this number, 85 times this number. So you wanna see what that would be? Let's see what that would be. 770,000 times 50 would be 38 and a half million people. So 41,300, 41,300, out of 38 million, that would be a 0.1% death rate. All comers, of course, the elderly, infirm, comorbidities, they are making up the majority of that 10th of a percent. What is the worst place in America right now with COVID? Of course, it's New York City. New York City had 627 deaths yesterday so uh and they have a total number of positive cases so remember this is just positive cases this is not um the number that we actually think is infected this is the total number of tested positive people is 247,000 and some change if we say okay with um they had 627,000 deaths out of this total number of cases, that would be a 0.2% death rate. If we said, um, again, I don't know, uh, there, we can go back and do it this way go to the United States. I don't think we did this yesterday. 1,500 deaths all throughout all of America. And I, uh, you know, I'm losing my train of thought. Let's skip that. So again, the death rate is very low. It's very low. And that is what's called the CFR. Okay. So that means that we've confirmed the people have it. And then we have a fatality rate for the people that have been confirmed to have it. And um, that confirmed rate is nowhere near 37%, right? We just talked about it. It's somewhere on a 10th of a percent. <clears throat> Even if it were 1%, that's nowhere near 37%, right? So if it were 10 times that. All right, so we'll get off of that. And let's talk about, <laughs> my experience today and um and this is this will be where i digress off of um, the field of, of medicine per se um so i stopped by the auto parts store today to pick up a fuse i replaced uh, some electrical components in my car and i blew a fuse because i'm not a mechanic I'm a weekend mechanic and I, I blew a fuse. So I stopped to get a fuse and uh, was, as I went to go in the store, tiny little store, I knew exactly where it was. So I was just going to grab it and walk out. Sorry, sir, you have to have a mask. They pointed to um, 47 sheets of paper that were taped to their windows um, that they'd printed off uh, with various city regulations. Uh, I'm in Travis County, so these are Travis County rules. 
Um, and I said, well, you know, I don't always read every, uh, every document posted to every wall as I'm walking into a store. Um, and you know, their, their windows are sheeted with paperwork, uh, you know, advertisements and all these things. And I mean, it would take me 30 minutes to read everything on the front of their store. So, uh, anyway, I digress. I walk in, they say, you have to have a mask on. I said, well, I don't have a mask. How about I just pull my shirt up I'm like this and I'll, well, pop that up there. Right. And they said, no, you can't do that. And I said, why can't I do that? And they said, cause that could fall off. I said, well, a mask could fall off. And they said, well, and I don't know if this is true, but the, what they told me was that Travis County rules said that, uh, I could, I could have a t-shirt around my mouth, but it couldn't be a t-shirt that I was wearing. So I took my shirt off and said, let's just make this awkward for everybody. I took my shirt off and I wrapped it around my face and they said, okay, that's fine. And so I went, got my fuses and I paid on the way out. Now I did a video Friday, I believe. Um, uh, and I talked about, um, I talked about the mask. Now, uh, I've been talking about the mask on and off, but I did some math and I came up with, um, you know, a visualization of it. it occurred to me today is much simpler to do that uh, than what I did. So um, here's the really easy way to think about the mask. If you have a surgical mask or uh, an N95 respirator, it's called N95 because it filters out 95% of kind of what's in the air. Um, meaning that 5% can get through. So they aren't hundred percent effective either. We wouldn't accept that for something like birth control. So uh, what we're doing is we're mitigating risk. We're reducing the number of viral particles that people are breathing in. And more importantly, we're reducing how much comes out. Now the big concern, the big fear uh, factor being thrown around is that this is an airborne, right? And it only makes sense to be wearing a mask if it is airborne unless you're in a closed confined area with dealing with people that you know have it. Um, so like in a medical community, it makes sense if you're going to be in a small room with somebody that you both, you both wear a mask during this. I would, I wouldn't balk at that. Um, but I, I did some math on, on the mask. So if you look, if you take a piece of cloth, so like a bandana or a t-shirt and you hold it up to the light, you can see through it, right? You can see little holes in there. So we'll give it the benefit of the doubt and we'll say that you're seeing the smallest possible hole that could be in the shirt. Um, so the smallest thing that your eyes could focus on, assuming you have good vision, would be 0.1 millimeter. Well, the COVID virus particle, if it is airborne, that means it's floating around in the air by itself like a dust particle that you see through sunlight when you walk in your house, you can see like little things glittering in there. Those are dust particles, right? Those float around and depending on how heavy they are and how hot it is and how humid it is and how much circulation air, like that depends on how long it takes the dust or the, how long it takes the dust settle to settle depends on all those factors. So we have this uh, particle that's floating around that's infinitesimally small and how small you ask? Great question. So uh, a, a nanometer, right? That's a hundred thousand times smaller than a millimeter. So if you could see 0.1 millimeter um, and a virus particle is basically 100, thousand or 10,000 times smaller, right? Uh, because it's 0.1, which means basically if, if the particle, if the virus were one inch, if you could make the virus one inch and make it a little one inch ball, and that's how big the virus is, the hole in your mask would be 83 feet wide, 83 feet by 83 feet. How many one inch viruses could you get through there? A lot. So the reason I bring this up is because if we are being rational, if we are implementing policies that, especially policies that are compulsive, right? And then I'll talk about that in a second. We do this based on science, right? We don't do this based on fear and emotion. It doesn't make any sense to use fear as a, as a mechanism for driving policy. So if there were scientific evidence that wearing a mask was going to make a difference in how many people were hospitalized or how many people uh, were seriously ill or how many people were exposed to the virus, 
that would be one thing. We don't know that that's true. Now, intuitively, it makes sense because we're blocking particles. Like if you cough and you sneeze and you know, you're putting little aerosol particles out there, like little water droplets that had the virus in there. Intuitively, it makes sense that that's got to be stopping something, right? Because if you cough, then it's on your mask, right? Like, and if you sneeze some fluid, it gets wet. So obviously, it's stopping some of it. Question is, if you keep wearing that mask and say it's a bandana or a t-shirt and you flip it around a couple of times and now it's all on the outside and I cough and I actually blow what's on the outside out. Um, so who, who knows if it helps? Intuitively, it makes people feel safer. I'm not going to argue whether or not making people feel safe is the, is the appropriate thing to do. But if you're going to make it illegal to not wear a mask, then I believe there should be some scientific foundation for it. Now, I'm not telling everybody to be civil disobedience and go out there and get arrested and all that other stuff. Uh, again, these aren't laws any even anyway. They're rules. Uh, the guy at the store tried to tell me it was a law. I said, no, it's not a law. <laughs> uh, it's a policy. It's a rule. It's not a law. Um, but he wasn't, you know, what he was just you know, responding to the limitations put on him. He, it wasn't, uh, I didn't take it personally and I, and I didn't attack him. Uh, for my frustration over it. But um, it, it's important to, the, the reason it's important to use science and not emotion or intuition about whether or not something should be a policy and a, God forbid it becomes a law. Um, yeah, there, well, there's, you know, there's lots of reasons. But compliance, uh, you know, the, the civil obedience, the compliance to this is going to be based on scientific evidence. So uh, you can implement things will and nilly if you've had if you had parents that did that or if you're a parent that does that you know that a bunch of arbitrary rules don't get followed well so you have there has to be a foundation for those rules and the older and wiser you get the more you understand the foundation so um, if there's hard scientific evidence which they come up with later then maybe you get people to keep wearing masks um, but currently, as it stands, there is no evidence that that's true. Um, in fact, you know, they, you can go to the CDC's website and go to NIH websites. You can go to, you know, you know, lots of medical journals, annuals of internal medicine, things like that, where they, they've done research on wearing masks and they've done research on social distancing and they've done lots of research on lots of the things that we're doing as preventive measures. And that science just isn't very good on it. I mean, it, it's just not, and I'm not, this is nothing to do with any political or uh, stance that I have. It, I, I'm just saying factually um, there's not good evidence that what we're doing matters. There's not good evidence that staying at home matters it's worth doing something when you don't know anything, but the more numbers we get, the more data we get, the more data driven this has to be, the more scientific it has to be. In the medical community, they say it all the time, when you do evidence-based medicine, which means that you don't do stuff that just seems like it would work. You do stuff that has been proven to work. So is it a big deal to wear a mask, to have to wrap a bandana on your face? Of course not. Like if it's between that and survival of the country, great, let's all do it. Um, it may not matter, <laughs> but it may. So we don't know enough right now. I'm not going to take a stance on whether we should or shouldn't be doing it. Um, but I'd just like to point out that it, even though it's not a big deal to wear a mask, and there will be people who attack me on this and say, I want people to die because I've made some negative comments about the science behind wearing masks. No, I've made scientific, I've made factual representations of scientific evidence. Again, I'm, this is not this is not my preference. I'm throwing out there. Where I will get slightly political is that we have to think about whether or not uh, this it we want to be driven by fear and whimsical uh, pol policies. So, not everyone in America is under the same regulations. Um, I would have thought Texas would be a little more lenient, but it's not. Um, you know, that we basically have to be wearing a mask if we're outside of our homes. Um, it, we can be in our yard, we can be exercising, and we can be experiencing homelessness, and then we don't have to wear a mask. Um, but 
if we say, okay, well, a mask is no big deal. What about goggles? You have to wear mask and goggles. Or what if you, okay, you have to wear mask and goggles and gloves. Or you have to cover your feet. You have to wear socks. You have to wear shoes. You have to wear mask and goggles. And well, you know what? What would definitely decrease the amount of um, coronavirus that we could spread and what would definitely decrease how much we could inhale or take is if we all wore hazmat suits, right? Or the big plastic suits that you see people wearing, um, you know, in movies when they're dealing with really hazardous areas, hazardous areas. Um, you know, we could all wear a gas mask around like you, you could go on infinitum. And, and the reason this is a big deal is because this is a compulsion of a behavior. We don't do compulsions of behavior very much. We do, um, you know, you've heard this saying, you know, the only thing you have to do is uh, the only the only have tos in life is, is death and taxes. You have to die. You're going to die. There's no way around that, and you have to pay taxes. Of course, it's not really true. You can go to jail instead of paying taxes, but they'll get their money eventually. Um, there's not that many compulsions. So uh, you have to wear a seatbelt in your car, but you don't have to wear a seatbelt if you're not in your car, meaning that you don't have to drive. You can choose not to drive. Uh, if you if if you have any sort of licensure, like a driver's license or a fishing license or a hunting license or a medical license, things like this, uh, there are state, uh, there are state controls. You have to have a certain amount of training. Uh, and once you sort of have a certain amount of training, uh, they, then they believe that it is, um, appropriate to put certain limitations on your behaviors and com and make it compulsory make force you to do certain things like wear seat belts so if you're just saying the general population now has to do something without any education or any licensing around it you're going to have pretty low uh compliance it's just it's just not going to work out that well if you're telling people they have to do something but you're not showing any evidence that it needs to be done for any certain reason. Now, again, it, it could be that masks are really effective. It could be that staying at home is really effective. It seems like intuitively that should work. Doesn't mean that it works. I can, I can guarantee you after being in the military for 20 years, uh, you know, being with the SEAL teams, you know, other special forces, doing lots of work, being a doctor, being in medicine, um, Lots of things that seem intuitive do not work. Uh, and oftentimes what's intuitive is the absolute worst uh, thing to do. So not telling everybody again to go out and be flippant and, and you know, not, not do what their policies are. You know, I'm not giving you political advice or legal advice or medical advice. I'm just throwing my two cents out there if you care. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense to um, use the data that we currently have uh, and guide policy off of that. Again, it doesn't, it's not even necessarily true that it's a good idea to prevent people from getting it right now. We don't know, had we done nothing, we don't know if it would have been a lot worse. We don't know if we would have overwhelmed the medical systems. What's true right now is that we didn't come anywhere close to overwhelming the medical systems. And New York is almost certainly going to be the worst city because it has the highest population density and uh, it had the least awareness of this. You know, they were kind of one of the first ones to be hit hard and they, they didn't have um, a lot of the things in place that we currently have. Um, and you know, one of the things that people have said, well, you know, we needed, uh, we needed all this pre-testing and then we needed to do those contact tracing. Well, you know, they did contract tape, they did contact tracing in the beginning and they couldn't do it. Like it overwhelmed, uh, the organization that was doing the contact tracing because there were just too many people to too many people came into contact with too many other people. So we're probably not going to have that data. We're probably not going to have great contact tracing and anyone who doesn't know what that means is basically if you find somebody who's positive, um, it, meaning you test them and you say, okay, they're positive for this coronavirus. How many people have they interacted with? How many people have they been in contact with? Well, if you're in New York and you ride the subway, how many people you're in contact with? Right? Like who knows? Um, so contact tracing is not going to be the end all be all. Uh, in more isolated areas, we can do that with a little with a little more certainty. We might get a feel for some numbers. 
But again, it's not necessarily true that what we've done has had any impact. It could have had an enormous impact. We simply don't know yet. We can compare ourselves to other people that aren't, um, you know, that aren't doing what we're doing. You know, something people like to throw out there is Sweden. And Sweden has done this much differently. They haven't really shut down the economy, but they have encouraged, um, you know, masks. They have encouraged social distancing. Uh, they've minimized certain business activities and group size. Actually, I'll back up on the mask. I don't know if they've recommended the mask or not, but you know they are behaving slightly differently uh, than they ordinarily do. You know, some some cities in America have completely locked down. Some cities have said, you know, we're we're not going to lock down. It's not that big of a problem. Uh, you know, Texas right now is pretty restricted, and we've had four hundred and some odd deaths out of thirty million people. That's that's a completely insignificant number of people. So the reason I say we don't know. Uh, you, somebody could say, well, point to the numbers. Well, there's 41,000 deaths. Of course, of course, this is you know, a horrendous thing and we're just barely hanging on. Again, it depends on how you count the deaths. But one thing that we do know is that um, you know, deaths from the normal causes of death have all decreased. And that's very likely because a lot of people who would have otherwise been labeled dying from cardiovascular disease, for example, or cancer, for example, those are now being classified as COVID deaths. Um, but if you look at the total number of people dying in the United States, and even if you look at the total number of people dying worldwide, the numbers actually decreased this year relative to the years before, if you look from January 1st till now. Um, so I'm not saying COVID doesn't exist. Don't even waste your time attacking me with that. I'm not saying that I'm not being glib. I'm not saying it's not important that people are suffering and dying, but suffering isn't binary. Death is not the only form of suffering. People are suffering at home. People are suffering from loss of uh, their loss of money, loss of jobs, loss of activities, loss of connection, loss of you know lots of things that we we have given up in our lives. And I just suggest that, the, that we're really damn sure that there's good evidence for us giving it all this stuff up. Uh, because if, there, if, it's not a, if it's not a statistically different, uh, statistically significant difference between staying at home and you know, restarting the economy, then you know, we should get there really, really quickly. And we have to do it to some extent anyway. Um, and that's going to take some courage, you know, what basically if you look at how the human brain is wired when we get really stressed when we get really scared and when we get sort of maximally scared we fight we flee or we freeze okay what we have done what we have done is choose to freeze because we don't know we didn't know enough about the enemy we didn't know how to fight well now we're at an area we're at a point where we can start fighting we can ease back into stuff and see if it starts changing the numbers, we can keep track of the numbers a lot better now. And if, is it leading to a bunch of new cases? More importantly, is it leading to a bunch of new critical cases? Is it leading to more deaths? Um, and you know, there is, there is death, there is risk inherent in life. Uh, you, 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 you have a risk of dying every single day of your life. Um, and we don't know if this is statistically significant we're we're hyper aware of it we're focusing on one threat that's what you do when you're in fight or flight so we chose to freeze now it is time to start fighting or i don't know fleeing maybe is uh, like fleeing some of the concepts that we were employing to try to control this disease but until we start taking action um we're sent we're essentially useless we're essentially frozen with fear until we start taking action we need to we need to dip our toe into the deep end and we need to start figuring out what actually matters what's actually making a difference and the only way to do that is to relieve some of the restrictions and start testing certain populations by doing that you can you can disagree with that all you want to, but if everybody just stays home forever, we all die, right? Uh, we all run out of money. We all run out of food. So people have to work. Um, you know, we have we have to get society going back to some degree. I'll get off my soapbox with that and just say, uh, you know, let's be really sure that what we're doing is scientific, uh, that is evidence based, that we have data to at least suggest that we know this is the right thing to do. Right now, I, I think it's pretty obvious we don't know what to do. 
Um, and so people are talking about doing other things and I encourage you to not shout those people down, to not get into this, um, you know, irrational behavior of saying, well, you know, it's totally binary. Either you want people to die or you want to stay home and, and wear a mask every time you leave the house. Yeah, I, come on. There's, there's a million variations of what we can do, how we can start approaching this. Um, but the fact that I can take my t-shirt off and wrap it around my face, but I can't put my t-shirt up around my face. Um, that's evidence that there's irrational behavior going on. Um, so irrational behavior occurs when people are afraid and they're making policy out of fear. And, um, it, it's time to have some courage. You know, that's, uh, that's just the way, uh, that's the way survival works. It requires courage. It requires risk. Um, and it requires us to move forward and take care of other things other than hyper-focusing on a single, uh, death threat, right? So we have a single thing that could kill us, coronavirus, and that's all we're caring about. And we aren't looking at death from any other cause. Well, worldwide, everyone who's died since January 1st, 90, over 99% of them have died from something other than coronavirus. So coronavirus isn't even on the radar for things that you should be worried about as a whole. It's as an absolute risk factor, it's not significant. It's really, really low. So let's let, let's start behaving like that and let's start making policy in that direction. And I will